I feel it's important to have an indigenous tour of Lake Winnipesaukee so that the knowledge doesn't fade away. Living in the lakes region, we get a lot of tourism. We have a lot of people that love to come and enjoy our waters, but they don't see the true history of the region. For us to document some of these sites today is important for posterity because they could eventually be all eliminated. Knowing we were going to leave from the Alton Bay area, we were going to travel up the west coast of the lake, all the way up through the Wares. We were going to try to use old records and archaeological reports to find different sites. And we knew we were looking for particular places along the route that have now been built up with family estates. The only way we can access some of these locations is from the water side. We started in Alton Bay. It was a gathering point of five tribes. A misunderstanding of five tribes could mean five family groups, but the idea that there was always a place of meeting in Alton Bay was a good place to start our research project. From what we can gather, our ancient ancestors lived here at least 13,000 years ago. The people that were there were hunter-gatherers. We roamed these areas as extended family groups or bands. It is believed that they're all familial groups led by a sisterhood of grandmothers in their related female relations. Abnaki homelands are called Nandakina, and it encompasses a vast majority of New England and Quebec. When you look at our territory, it goes up to the St. Lawrence and all the way down to Massachusetts, down to the coast, and over to Lake Champlain. We're going to proceed out into the lake itself. We're going to go by several prominent, well-known islands. To our left, we're looking at the Belknaps, which includes Mount Major, Straight Back, and Gunstock, the well-known ski resort. If we look to our far right, we're looking at the Ossipes. So when we're looking at those two ranges, you can also look all the way down the lake, looking towards the Presidential Range, and you can see Mount Washington. The waterways were important to us as indigenous people because they were the highways of the past. We would see the land from the water, where today we see the water from the land. So finding some of these ancient spots on the land is difficult because sometimes you can only see them from the water. We should always be mindful that a lot of our stone tools or lithic materials were gathered from these various mountain ranges. It is very important for us because we can find trade routes and, and the use of these materials form a pattern of man-made activities. Lake Winnipesaukee is one of the largest land surrounded bodies of water that's in one particular location. If you look at us as a, a water people, it was one of the major watersheds that we had as well as Sebago Lake over in Maine. The name Winnipesaukee is wetland area or water area that is with as many lakes and ponds to make a region. The first island that we stop at would be Rattlesnake Island. Historically, we would have had rattlesnakes on this island. However, they were eradicated when a colonial decided to build his homestead on that island. And he also took the venom from the rattlesnakes and sold it as a witch doctor remedy. Visiting Rattlesnake Island is bittersweet for us because we enjoy being able to visit a land that was a little taboo or forbidden to some degree, but at the same time, we're mournful at the loss of life that had taken place so long ago. Because we were exploring indigenous sites, we were trying to find with other things beyond those lithic old stone structures. And one of the things we came upon on uh, Rattlesnake Island was we found that there were birch trees that had chiaga on them. It's believed that inside this growth structure there's a fibrous orange material that when extracted can be made into teas by infusing it in hot water, which would have been something that our ancestors would have 
harvested for its medicinal purposes. One of the goals on our trip today is to possibly find a prayer seat that had been described in newspaper articles. They were typically made out of lithic materials with a flat, large stone that would be the seat cushion and there could have been arms on each side and a backing to it. We found a site that was allegedly a stone prayer seat. We inspected it and came to the conclusion that it was almost too perfect. The unusual thing about it, it was not cited as an indigenous site would have been cited along lines for summer solstice or equinox observation. It does have an east-facing view, but it is 45 degrees off of where it should be for a typical press seat for indigenous purposes. We departed Rattlesnake to Stone Dam Island, where we were to explore the island looking for the reported findings of a site called Pitch Rock. Stone Dam Island is a drumlin, which was formed underneath the ice uh, the, of the last glacial period. And if you look up behind us here, uh, this hillside is a fairly thick uh, glacial till. Carried along with the till were these boulders and these boulders are part of the Winnipesaukee Quartz Diorite, which is the underlying bedrock of the entire uh, Winnipesaukee Basin. The current owner of the site on Stone Dam Island is very excited that we were coming out to document. Besides the pitch rock, she had also found pottery pieces and has invited us back to continue to research the island. The most common way to travel the lakes and rivers in New England was in dugout canoes or in birch bark canoes. Dugout canoes were constructed by slowly burn the base of the tree until the tree fell. And then we would slowly start mini fires all over the log until we hollowed out the log to make it into a satisfactory canoe. They had to be very large in diameter, but what was good about a dugout, it was very durable. It was very common for us to put rocks in that canoe to sink it deliberately. And we'd know where it was along the shore because we'd leave a marker. And then what we could do is go back into the water and take the rocks out of the canoe and refloat it and we'd have the canoe again. This is how we find them today. The other method was using birch bark and shaping the birch bark uh, into a canoe, which is why pitch rock was so important. We're looking at a uh, erratic here that was camped in some fashion to make a groove and there's a lip where a container could be set in there. Pitch rock was used to take pine pitch and charcoal and mix it, mix it together in an appropriate ratio to use as a sealant on the canoes to make them waterproof. We use this pine pitch to secure arrowheads and spear points, knife blades. It was also used to waterproof inside of baskets and buckets and other birch containers. You have to remember when we heated pine pitch, we mixed it with other things, either bear grease or with charcoal. The charcoal gives it a binding tendency like an epoxy, and if we put bear grease in it, it could be used for canoes. In theory, this could be a, a pitch rock or a pine pitch rock where they would have made the adhesive ingredients up here with a fire and it would run off. Right now we're at a spot where this groove was dug out so a bowl could be placed in its place. And as the melted material came down, it would have filled the trough and the trough would have filled up, and as you can see, the water comes down and pours directly into the cup. So when we look at the two kinds of vessels, one is major waterways, like lakes and large ponds, you'd find these dugouts. Whereas the birch bark canoes were more fragile and more usable for us to, to use in transport.
As you go from Stone Dam Island towards the Weirs site, you can see the highlands that made up the village at the river outflow. When you look at those highlands, you can understand why we would have had a village there facing east, overlooking a large lake region. It is believed that there were extended settlements all along the Merrimack River watershed from the Atlantic shore up to the Franklin area. The whole river landscape was a garden or a planting area for us from Franklin all the way to the Weirs area. After we docked at the public docks in Weirs Beach, we walked down to what is now known as Endicott Rock. This is the Weirs Channel. This was the site of the fishing weirs. This point was where we were able to harvest the fish just before they were made their way to spawn into the lake. And a site like the Weirs would be a great location for us to uh, harvest fish and process them, especially in the spring. And uh, drying the fish would be part of a village life. In 1652, the surveyors were sent to, to find the headwaters of the Merrimack River, and they came to this spot and, and claimed that three miles north of this point was the limit of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But the key point is that those uh, surveyors that came uh, were led by two native guides who were specifically hired by them and their names appears in the historical record that they were going to be paid for their work. If we come to the 21st century, we look at the plaque here and the monument that's been put up and we still have no reference. What this plaque fails to recognize is that there were thousands of indigenous people already living in this region. For the English to travel into an area that's clearly inhabited by people and claiming it as their own is a, is a clear use of the doctrine of discovery. What we would like to do as part of our project is to bring the documentation up to date to include the names and the recognition of the two gentlemen that led the expedition here. While we're in this particular area of Laconia, this is a rich site. On one side of the river, there is a, an old uh, drive-in theater, which was identified many, many years ago as a historically significant Abnaki village site. It was found to have so many artifacts, it was put on a historical register as a protected site. And on the other side of the river, we can look at it as one contiguous fishing and village site for many, many generations. We're uh, at a site that the uh, original uh, founder of this park, or the developer of this park, envisioned and this as a historic Abnaki or indigenous uh, site. And uh, this has been a long project of uh, Don Richards, who passed away two years ago. And he wanted this to happen to get accurate information. And to honor that particular commitment to the park's creation, uh, this monument, this granite monument and plaque were erected. It's city-owned parkland, 22 acres. Um, we have an outdoor pavilion with picnic area, children's playground, and an outdoor amphitheater. Trips and tours like this are important to bring history to life. As we rediscover ancient sites, we will plot them on our mapping system and we'll endeavor to conduct further historical research to develop a better concept of what indigenous lifeways were like in the pre-colonial times. There were pieces of us everywhere. Our mountains, our street names, our place names. Yeah, everything comes back to the original inhabitants and the indigenous people of this land. And it's time for New Hampshire to stop ignoring us. These sites are still there, hidden in the woods and hidden little gems that we'd like to find and we'd like to document them. There was a rich and dynamic culture here of people with their own ways, their own language, their own ceremonies. We have been inhabiting this region for you know, tens of thousands of years and we still inhabit it today. I think people should be mindful 
that we only highlighted only a small fraction of sites along the region here. Some of them protected because it's on private land and ownership, but we wanted to illustrate that these sites are out there. Indigenous people aren't the only people who are interested in history. There are plenty other people that are interested in history and in, in the true history of a region, not just the colonialized version. In order to have a common future, we have to have a common past. And the only way we can have a common past is by accepting everyone's story, not just the colonial story. <laughs> Manik will dominana, holy do go 